Good morning, everyone. How good is it? Blue sky, bright sunshine. Here we are in central Victoria, Dalesford, central Victoria in Australia. Albeit it's freeze, but that's okay. It is winter. It is winter. I'm going to, uh, we're, we're continuing in the series called Winter in the World, so it's appropriate that this is that. And this is the third in the series of that. The first, you may recall, was shared on Mother's Day. And it was entitled, God Loves Mothers, and what the Bible says about Christian mothers. Last month, we shared the, uh, the message entitled, Christian Living Today, based around Psalm 24, about us entering into God's presence and he into ours, and the expectation of how Christians should be living uh, in today's challenging world. Well, today's message, for those taking notes and those online, today's message is entitled, The Father, Heart of God, with a subtitle, Embracing God's Unconditional Love. So we have mothers, we have coming into God's presence and he into ours, and now we're going to talk about fathers, but the Father, heart of God. I want to talk to you about God's love as a loving Father. Now, we've all experienced various types of fatherhood in our lives, some positive, some maybe not so positive. But I want to share with you the incredible truth that we have a heavenly Father who loves us conditionally and deeply cares about each one of us. Now I, I hope you were noticing in the second song this morning the, the verse was talking about the heart of the Father. The heart of the Father. And in the last song we're talking about Abba. Abba translates to basically meaning Daddy. Daddy. We were, call, we were singing a song about Father Heart of God, and we were calling him Daddy. That's the relationship. My goodness, Holy Spirit has set this up already, hasn't he? He placed this word on my heart some weeks ago, and here we are singing and moving into God's presence, and he's calling us to call him Daddy. So what is the Father Heart of God? The Father Heart of God refers essentially to a relational and the deep loving nature of God as a compassionate and nurturing father figure. It describes a deep affection, care, provision that God extends to his children. And it highlights the characteristics and qualities associated with a loving earthly father, but in a perfect and transcendent way. Transcendent basically meaning beyond and above any of our human knowledge or experience or our understanding. Now, the timing of this <clears throat> is very interesting. And I only connected this yesterday, as yesterday was the two-year anniversary of the passing of my own father, Colin. Dad was age 92. Um, he lived a full and energetic life right up until the very end of his time here on earth. And so here I am preparing over these weeks to talk about the father heart of God and yet, the weekend that I share this message, I'm remembering the love and affection and care and provision of my own father. I've got no doubt that he's up in heaven. Dad was a Christian all his life. Dad is up in heaven, hanging out with his own mother and father and with his own heavenly father, God. 
when, we, when you were a child, for some of us, we've got to cast our mind back a little while. Me too. But when you were a child, what did you want to do when you grew up? Did you want to be a police officer, a firefighter, a teacher, a nurse, maybe a pilot, a journalist? I remember as a youngster many people asking me that question. I don't know whether we ask that question today. Maybe the, the opportunities are so broad. But I remember being asked that question many, many times and I suspect you might have as well. But I remember the answer that I gave. And I'm sure it's not what people expected. But this is the answer I gave every single time. My reply was, I wanted to be half as good as my own father was. End quote. That is what I wanted to be. It's not what I wanted to do. My answer was, time and time and time again, it's the only answer I ever gave. I wanted to be half as good as my own father. As simple as that. No more, no less. You see, it was about who I wanted to be, not what I wanted to do. And without wanting to sound too critical, I, I think many of us, many of us, and those online here today, I, I think that we seek to answer the wrong question. What we want to do is not nearly as important as what we want to be and who we are in the eyes, in God's eyes. And the longer I live, the more significant that question and that realisation becomes. You see, it's possible to do lots and lots of things and my life has been full of adventure and experiences and travel and learning and meeting great people and journeying to all sorts of different ways in my life. It's possible to do lots of things, but to be zilch as a person. I'm not sure where zilch actually came from. It sounds German, but I think we understand. Zilch, for those of you who don't understand, means nothing, means zero. We can do lots of things in this world, but we can be nothing as a person. For many of us, we've carried for a very long time potentially a, a sense of insecurity around our being, who we see ourselves are, how others th think of us. And for some, a life of unforgiveness of ourselves or for those who may have wronged us in the past, even our own fathers. I'm aware that not everyone here today and those watching online have had a good or a healthy experience or relationship with their own father. And in some cases, may never have even known who they were or who they are. This is a tough and difficult subject. Hurt and pain are not very far below the surface for so many. The concept of a, the Father heart of God emphasises for each one of us a personal and intimate relationship that God desires to have with every one of us, every one of us, everyone on the planet. That's the desire of God's heart for every one of us. It reveals God's as a, God as his role as like a loving parent. We can understand that. How, how wonderful it is to see so many young people and young children in church here today. I suspect there was a time, I suspect there was a time in this town and many towns like it where church was being, the door was open, but no young people were entering in. God is blessing this community. God is blessing the outreach of Dalesford Community Church. 
God bless the children of this house. God's role as this loving parent, it's, it, is, it, it, it offers us a sense about his guidance, about his provision, about his correction and the comfort that he wants to bring to his children, to you, to you, to you, watching online and to me. It reflects his nature, his desire, God's desire to be actively involved in the lives of his creation. That's you and me. That's you and me. He wants to be actively involved in our lives. And while he gives us breath on this earth, he's interested and caring for you because you are a child of his. The Bible... The Bible teaches us many profound truths about the Father, heart of God. And I want to dive into the depths of this Father, God's fatherly love and discover how it can transform lives even today. Even today in this world of liberalism and challenge and wokeism, whatever the heck that is, God wants to be part of our lives. And for those of you who have been listening to uh, me speak for some period of time, uh, I speak in numbers or I speak in letters, you know, three C's, five M's. Today, it's about the number nine. Number nine. I want you to write that down here as well. I'm going to share with you nine key points about the Father heart of God. And for those of you taking notes... I've got a little cheat sheet for you, some homework that you can take and with you at the end of today, some of the Bible verses that I would encourage you, ask Holy Spirit to come and, and reveal to you what it is about these nine characteristics, these nine profound truths around the Father heart of God. Number one, God's love has no conditions. Unlike human love, God's love is not based on what we do or how we perform or whether we're worthy or not. His love is limitless and unchanging. Quite simply, he loves us because he's, we're his children. As simple as that. One John chapter three verse one, and I'm not going to read each of these verses here. You'll have your little uh, homework sheet there as well. But one John chapter three, verse one says this: How great is the love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. For that is what we are. End quote. A statement, pure and simple. Because he's our father. He loves us. We're his children. Pure and simple. So therefore it's not about earning his love. The fathers in this house here today, it's not like their children have to earn the love of a father. That comes because it's deep within them. God's nature is a loving father and I encourage you to read 1 John chapter 4 from verse 7 to the end of the chapter and it's essentially all about God's love and our love. 1 John chapter 4 verse 7 to the end. But it, this nature of loving father, it's about receiving it as a gift. So you see God's love is available to everyone. Isn't that right, Pastor Ross? Your message, your method your ministry for your whole life, for the two of you, has been sharing God's love to those potentially in most need of it. We all need God's love. We all need this God's love. But there are many in the community and many around us that are struggling with identity about who they are. It's not about how God sees them. You see, his love is available to everyone, regardless of 
our past mistakes or our current struggles. Just take a moment to, to grasp that. This amazing truth that the creator of this unbelievable universe that we're sharing here in today, for this brief moment in time that we are here, the creator of the universe loves each one of us with such an everlasting love and he desires a personal daddy relationship with every one of us. Point two for those taking notes. God deeply cares about us. You see, our Heavenly Father's not distant. He's not unfeeling. He deeply cares about every aspect, every aspect of our lives. He knows our joys, our sorrows. He understands our challenges. He understands the things that we're confronting. And just like a loving father, he's moved with compassion when we are hurt and when we struggle. He understands our weaknesses and he understands our sorrows. Psalm 103, verse 13. And he's there to comfort and to console us, Isaiah 66, 13, and we can pour our hearts out to him knowing that he truly understands and he truly cares. You see, God's fatherly care provides us a safe place to find solace, but also to find strength. Point three, God provides and God protects. So as a loving father, God takes care of our needs. His children, Matthew, read the story, Matthew 6, 31 to 33. He's our faithful provider, ensuring that we lack nothing essential. And so just as an earthly father and those here today provide for their children, our heavenly father knows what we need before we ask him. And he also is to protect us from harm. Psalm 91, 11 and 12. God, as our Father, watches over us. Psalm 121, verse 7. And even during challenging times, he is our refuge and he is our strength. Psalm 91, verse 2. We all, we all can find comfort and safety in his loving daddy arms. Point four. It's interesting, um, talking about numbers, I've got my notes here written not in one, two, three, four, but in Roman numerals. Why do I do that? I've got point four here as one V. For those of you, that's four. And for those of you who don't know, when I get to five, it'll be V. So this is one before five. Point one V, or four. You're such a strange character, Peter. (laughs) Point four, one V. Pay attention here, folks. School teacher. No, not at all. Discipline and instruction. God's fatherly love includes, and it happens here, and I see it in my own family and, and in my own grandchildren here, we all need discipline Loving discipline and an instruction. Why? For our growth and our maturity, for our development. It's still taking place, Greg, in your and my life. We need that guidance. We need the framework around it. Discipline and instruction. And God corrects us not out of harshness but out of love to lead us on the right path. So just as our earthly fathers correct and train their children. God, as our heavenly Father, disciplines us for our benefit. Proverbs 3, 11 and 12, and Hebrews 12 and 6. You see, his his, his discipline is motivated by love and it's aimed at shaping our character and leading us to a righteous path. Point V, God forgives and restores. I think we get this, don't we? And for many people, 
they only think of God as a God who supposedly forgives and restores. If only so many of us and those watching online would just get to that point as a start. God's love as a father is characterised essentially for, by around this concept of forgiveness and this would be a, a topic that would be wonderful to, to share at some stage around forgiveness and restoration. And when we turn to him in, in repentance, what does repentance mean? It's a kind of an old-fashioned churchy word. basically means, I'm sorry. As simple as that. I'm sorry. It's a word that we probably should use more often for ourselves and to others around us. I'm sorry. We make mistakes. We stuff up. Things go wrong. I'm sorry. When was the last time you said to God... I'm sorry. I actually said that this morning. When we turn to him in repentance or when we say sorry, God is ready to forgive our mistakes and our wrongdoings. I don't like the word sins. It's a heavy word. I grew up in church where they're talking about sins and doing stuff that's wrong and kind of what comes out of that. It's guilt that comes over the top of us, isn't it? But essentially, we stuff up. That's modern language for making mistakes and doing wrong things. And 1 John, chapter 1, verse 9, um, and I think you all know this is such a a popular, well-known thing, but essentially here, um, his grace is abundant and his mercy knows no end. Let me read that to you. Such a powerful, powerful verse here. 1 John, chapter, sorry, 1 John, chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, if we say it, we're sorry for our mistakes and the things that we muck up, he, Father God, is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Such a powerful, powerful verse. We, we talk in, in church around grace and mercy. God's grace is abundant and his mercy knows no end. Now, I often sit there and think, grace and mercy, which one is which? I have to kind of work it out. Grace is we did not, did not get what we deserve. Sorry, let me just do it. We did get, sorry, let's get this right. See, I'm still mucking it up. I'm learning, I'm learning. I'm just a kid, still growing. Grace, we did receive what we didn't deserve. Grace, we did receive what we didn't deserve. And mercy, mercy is we did not get what we did deserve. Mercy. And this concept of forgiveness and what Jesus did on the cross and Jesus' role is about mercy, about taking the place for us. We did not get what we deserved. For I am muck ups. And just as a loving father welcomes back us as uh, kind of this prodigal child, okay, stimulate thinking, prodigal child, that means the story in Luke chapter 15, verses 11 to 32. We think of that story as the story of the prodigal son. That's not it. Jesus told that story, story, a parable, a story. Jesus told that story as a way of pointing to the Father heart of God. The story should be called the story of a loving father. That's what the story is about. Jesus was pointing, when he told that story, he was pointing to the story about the Father heart of God. And that's an incredible story. When you read it, it says, and that moving part for me is, when the son was afar, the father saw him and ran towards him. 
the father had no choice because he was his son. It was deep within him and he saw him returning. He who he thought was lost has been found and the father ran towards him. Our heavenly father, our daddy, eagerly awaits for our return. We're in church. We're hearing a message. But what about your neighbours? What about your friends? What about those on the community? What about those who are listening or should be listening to this message today? Do they need to return to the loving arms of their daddy God? I'm sure they do. God is waiting for our eager return and longs to restore relationship. You see, his love is not based on our past failures. God's love is about healing, restoring, restoration, transformation. Such a power point, just that one alone, isn't it? Point six. The Father's loving guidance. So just like our earthly father, our heavenly father guides us along life's journey. Now I've had a few years on that life's journey and one or two of you here, likewise. It's been a relatively in earthly time, a longish journey. My goodness, I could give you testimony after testimony and story after story, but for what God did and intervened and guided me on my life, my goodness, Uh, my life would be vastly, vastly different and not certainly better. He provides, has for me and for many of us, but for his children, here's the promise, God provides us wisdom, direction and instruction through his word, the Bible. Psalm 119, verse 105 God's loving guidance navigates us through the challenges and some of the decisions that we face. Do you, how many times and do you when you are facing every day, weekly, monthly, when you are facing decisions, sometimes challenging, sometimes difficult, are you as your natural first course presenting it back to God? Father, What should I do here? Or, and this is particularly to blokes, well, I'll work it out, I'll sort it out, I'll go back in the man's shed and we'll hammer a few things and I'll work it through in my mind and we'll go and do it. Our challenges and our situations, big, even small, God says, bring them to me. Bring them to me. And I'll give you some wisdom and I'll give you some guidance, I'll give you some insight into what that in all the decisions and the challenges that we face. You see, he does not leave us alone to figure things out, but rather he's wanting to offer his loving hand to lead us in the paths of righteousness, to lead us in the paths that are right for us. Psalm 23, verse 3, says exactly that, doesn't it? And when we, when we seek his guidance, he faithfully directs our steps and brings clarity to our minds. I love that. When I wrote that, I just, yeah, I get that. I get that. He faithfully directs our steps, shows me the path that we should leave, but he also brings clarity, clearness, understand, clarity to our minds about what that should be. And so where we live, this, this concept of from confusion to clarity. Is that where you want to be? Then here's where you need to go. And it's all found in God's word and in Holy Spirit's working with us in our hearts and minds. Point seven. This is a good one. The joy of being his children. Christmas Eve, the night before the royal show. Maybe the night before Easter Sunday. God takes great delight in us, his children. We, we're his children. God rejoices over us with singing and joy in our, in, in our presence. Now, here's a, 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 a Bible, cha- um, Bible book that I suspect many of us haven't read too often. 
Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17 is where I would encourage you there. Now, Zephaniah, for those, is go to the middle of the book, which is Matthew. Malachi's on that side. Malachi. Zephaniah's backwards. It's go, go left. Zephaniah. And, it, and I suspect you probably should look it up in the index. Zephaniah 3, verse 17. But just as a loving parent celebrates achievements and growth in their children, God delights as well. God's up there high-fiving. He's, he's getting excited about the things that we do. He genuinely does because we're his, we're his children. He celebrates our victories, big and small, and there is comfort for us in times of sadness. Father's joy over us gives us a sense of God's love for us gives us a sense of belonging and significance. Reminding us that we are deeply loved, that we are deeply cherished. Point eight. Adoption into God's family. Through faith in Jesus Christ, we are adopted into the family of God. Look at the book of Galatians, chapter 3, verse 26. And then the next chapter, chapter 4, verses 5 to 7. We are his children. And because we're his kids, we get all the benefits and we get all the inheritance that comes with being his kids. As simple as that. When my kids are growing up, they don't have to come and ask my permission. Dad, can I have a piece of toast and a cup of tea? Can I have some wheat bix? Am I allowed to have two or three? It's theirs. They're all the benefits of being my, my children. What I will have is theirs. They don't have to ask for permission. Everything that I've got belongs to them. In the right order, at the right time, God's fatherly love extends to all who believe in him, regardless of our background, our past mistakes. We're all part of God's family. Do you know what? We no longer have to be orphans my goodness, that is such a powerful message there, sitting alone, the orphan spirit. There are many of us, many that we know, and many may be listening on here, who carry an orphan spirit. That in itself is worth un un unpacking. We do not need to have an orphan spirit because we are beloved children. We are loved by him, we are embraced by his love. And our adoption into his family as his children, guess what? It unites us as a, as a community of believers. We have family here, a community of believers, forming a loving and supportive spiritual family. And, and there'll be some of you watching online and you say, oh, I only wish I had a loving, supportive community family. Well, it exists and it exists in a Bible-believing Christian church, and it certainly exists in this place and in this house. And as his children, God welcomes us, making us heirs and co-heirs with Christ. That is such an awesome verse, Romans 8, verse 17. And we get to share the blessings and the promises of God. And point nine... God is an ever-present Father. He's always with us. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. No, no, you're not, you're not good enough. You've stuffed up there. No, I'll come back and see how you're going. Doesn't do it that way. Hebrews 13, verse 5. And in times of trouble or uncertainty, he is our refuge. He's our strength. Psalm 41, verse 1. And his presence, his presence, which is what we were sharing before, Psalm 24, we move into his presence and God promises for, to be in our presence. His presence brings comfort, security and peace. We can approach God at any time. We don't have to wait till Sunday. We don't have to wait, get up at 5 a.m. in the morning or he's only there at 10 p.m. at night. 
you know, it's like got to check in, you've got to make it hard to get in front of God, get in the line, take a number. No, no, it's not like that at all. We can approach him at any time and in knowing that he's always there to listen, to understand and to provide for us. The Father's constant presence in our lives assures us that we will never be alone. Even in the times when we feel it, feelings will let you down. Feelings will lead you into areas where confusion exists. This is faith. This is reality. God's presence is constant in our lives and he will never, ever leave us alone. Now, for some of us... uh, Deep breath out. For some of us, this, is, um, this may open up a new chapter in your life. A journey of discovery, a deep understanding about God's love and his care for you. This is a tough subject for some. And yet this is for others and for all of us. This is about revelation. This is about us remembering who we are and who God is. And in addition to the study of my Bible, I I have found a a very powerful and helpful book written by uh, a gentleman by the name of, which is interesting for up here, Jack Frost. True story, there it is. His name is Jack Frost. Jack Frost. Jack Frost has written a book that explores the uh, profound love and grace, getting what we what we received but what we didn't deserve around the profound love and grace uh, of God the Father. And the book is entitled Experiencing Father's Embrace. Daddy putting his arms around you. And Jack delves into the concept of experiencing this unconditional love, acceptance and this embrace, this hugging, this coming together of God as a loving father figure. The central theme of this book um, revolves around healing and restoration. And it can be found through coming into this and encountering and understanding and encountering God's love. Jack Jack draws on his own experiences, um, some of them very painful. Um, He draws on Bible teaching and testimonies to provide insights and and some practical guidance on, on how to experience this deep, intimate relationship with God and it addresses some of the wounds and hurts that many of us have from our own earthly fathers or other relationships that present um, and what he does, he presents God is in, in this perspective around healing and finding wholeness from God as our perfect father. This book um, offers hope and encouragement to those seeking to deepen their relationship with God and find healing maybe from the past. Um, It's a guide for individuals um, towards their journey of understanding and experiencing everything from an all-encompassing, from the Father, from the love of God our Father. However, I would strongly encourage each one of us that the starting point is the Bible. The Word of God. This is a guide. This is an experience. It's someone's story. It's his understanding. And it may be very, very helpful for many of us. But our starting point and our always go back is what God is saying to us through his Word, understanding through revelation through Holy Spirit. So as we reflect here on the Father heart of God, let's remember that God's love is not just some theological idea. It's not some preacher getting up here and spruiking on about theology and academia. This is about reality. You see, in in many ways, there's a very simple question that each one of us need to ask. And the very first question, right at the top of the tree of the map is, Is there a God, yes or no? That's the very first question every one of us on earth should answer. Is there a God, yes or no? If the answer is no, 
party time. You've got 50, 60, 80, 90 years, go and enjoy, who cares, there's no consequences, whatever. Look after yourself and others, it's party time. There's no God, there's no consequence, there's no anything at the end. Guess what? Much of the world has answered that question directly or indirectly, consciously or subconsciously, no, and that's their life experience. Guess what? Pain and hurt and anguish and a lot of things are down the other end of it all. Now, that's just because you believe in God or become a Christian doesn't mean you don't, you're immune from that. However, if the answer is, yes, there is a God, God of the universe, God of the creation, but God our Father, then it seeks a response from every one of us. Not just academic, not just listening to some message and walking out of here and saying, it makes no difference to me. It does make a difference. It should make a difference. If God is true, if God is alive and God is through his word and his promises to us, our daddy, then what's our response back to him? Because he's waiting for that embrace. It's a reality that we can experience God in our everyday life. We can embrace his love, his care, his provision, his protection, his forgiveness and the restoration and can transform us from inside out. His presence empowers us to live with confidence, clarity and with hope. You see, when we understand the Father heart of God, it can transform the way we see ourselves and the way we see others. It can compel us to extend love and grace and forgiveness to those around us. And just like at the very beginning of what I was saying, it assures that our identity in who we are, not in what we do, we are cherished children of God with rights and privileges that come with being that. May we open our hearts to the fatherly love of God and and may we allow him to surround us, to envelope us, to shape us. And as we go from this place today, let's take hold of this truth. Let's take hold of this truth and do something about it and walk in confidence that we are deeply loved by the greatest father of all. May his love fill each one of us to overflowing and may we be empowered to love others as he loves us and that we can become a testimony to the word of the Father heart of God. Let us pray.